Since then, thousands of national and municipal public corporations established human rights management committees and adopted uh, human rights management policies. But still, this framework usually does not work to resolve actual individual instances or cases properly. Secondly, the Korean government inserted a chapter on business and human rights within the National Action Plan for Human Rights. Even though it talks about institutionalizing human rights management, it's not that clear about human rights due diligence and human rights impact assessment. Thirdly, there is a new bill called the Basic Act on Human Rights Policies proposed by the government, which includes duties of companies and proper remedies. In addition, there is also an initiative to legislate a mandatory human rights due diligence by human rights groups. They came up with a draft and have been discussing with a member of the National Assembly for introduction of the bill to the National Assembly. It's very hard to predict when and which act with what contents will be passed by the National Assembly. Lastly, like many other countries, there is a prevalent discourse on ESGs in Korea. The president and the government, the big firms and big law firms talk about ESGs. My colleague, Yong Ah Park, is a member of the ESG committee of the Korean Bar Association, KBA, recently formed with lawyers from major law firms and ESG consulting firms. Yong Ah, can you tell us a bit about the KBA ESG committee? Please. Yong Ah. Yes, uh, yes, hello. Um, I'm Yong Ah Park. I'm um, uh, working with uh, Kyu Hwang at Bunga, and I'm honored to be part of this conference and um, this session especially. I'll give you a brief introduction uh, regarding the recent uh, formation of the ESG committee in the Korean Bar Association. Mm -hmm. um, as as Pilgyu just explained, in Korea discussions on business and human rights were originally initiated by civil society and less by the legal community. Uh, though the International Human Rights Committee of the Korean Bar Association, which is also led by Pilgyu's chair, uh, covered business and human rights issues. Uh, and in the recent years, Korea also has seen a so-called ESG fever, though it is questionable whether the ESG-themed funds actually follow any concrete guidelines to pursue the claimed goals. Uh, but anyway, the enthusiasm for ESG, uh, though it came as as a kind of surprise to civil society because uh, when we engaged with corporations on human rights issues, because especially SMEs, but also bigger companies, and uh, within those bigger companies, those staff working in other than CSR departments, uh, the main res response that we got was like, uh, it's all very good talk, but do you know how hard it is to make money? Do you know the hardships our employees go through when they try to make business in far from home and so on? So the good thing is that the ESG talk in the business community has led to a kind of mainstreaming of the concepts, which in part also led to the Korean Bar Association uh, to form an ESG community in, committee in June this year. Um, it started out with co-hosting a forum on institu institutionalizing ESG, uh, which mainly discussed enactment of a human rights and environmental due diligence act. Um, the ESG committee members are mostly, uh, mostly belong to major law firms or work as in-house counsel or for consulting firms. It is not clear whether they are more interested in the pro bono aspect or as representing stakeholders or see it more as an opportunity to expand their legal businesses. But everything is still in its early stages and we have to see how it goes. I was invited to join the committee as a sort of uh, member of civil society because Gongam, uh, the organization I belong to, is a member of KTNC Watch, which monitors human rights violations occurring in the course of overseas operations by companies headquartered in South Korea. Um, I think. Uh, I don't know how it is in other countries, but personally, my sense is that corporate lawyers have a kind of threefold position. One as lawyers generally who wish to uphold the rule of law. Uh, one, 
as corporate lawyers who wish to expand their business, uh, which leads them to favor regulation, which is a good thing, but then also as legal representatives of their clients, which are the corporations, uh, which not always aligns with the former two positions, uh, especially in situation where business interest clashes with that of stakeholders. For example, one point that is very important for civil society is making corporations accountable for human rights violations uh, they caused or contributed to, but I sense that the approach of corporate law lawyers is rather cautious with regard to that point and with a view to limiting such liability. Um, there is a subcommittee within the ESG committee that is planning to draft a mandatory due diligence act about this project too is in its early stages and not much to say about that right now. As a note, the Korean Bar Association recently got a questionnaire asking them about the activities in the business and human rights area and I uh, from the Japanese Bar Association and the ESG community is currently drafting a response and I hope there will be further opportunities uh, for the Korean Bar Association to interact with the Bar Associations of other countries. Thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. That's great uh, for any sort of cooperation, even Japanese uh, uh, associations. And uh, I think the Korean is a uh, more step forward uh, than Japan. <laughs> Japanese still. Uh, I, if, if I may, I, I'm going to make some comments on this. Uh, oh yeah, please, uh, please, yes. Human human security in yeah, yeah, Thank you. So um, to to make our I mean today's discussion more constructive and live and interactive. Sure, sure. I will make some critical oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> comments welcome. Yeah, on this yeah. index. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This... Uh, first, uh, just mentioned about this Asian context that mm -hmm. leads to some need for the, I mean, I mean this index with context. Right. But I mean, what, what do you mean by the Asian context yes, in terms yes, of business and human rights? I mean, loss of jobs because mm. of companies withdrawal. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not nothing to do with so-called Asian context from my mm. point of view. Mm. Secondly, there is a strong emphasis on em empowerment, um, mm. but I think we have different definition of empowerment from the mm. beginning. Mm. So is, there, is, is empowerment something new? I mean, from my understanding, mm. access to information, participation, mm. ownership in decision-making are key elements in human rights-based yeah, yeah. approach and empowerment is part of it. Yeah. So the, the formula of social contribution activities equal uh, empowerment. Mm. can be, uh, I mean, confusing and misleading. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thirdly, is it realistic to have another standard mm. in addition to the UNGP, ESGs, and, and so mm. on, with all the different or similar standards used by various national and international actors? Yeah. It yeah. is probably not easy to come up with some clear, substantial yeah. added value. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So... Um... Appreciate your uh, very critical uh, comments. In fact, uh, maybe we discuss later on this uh, uh, comments. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, these are also the weakness and actually point to be discussed with you from other countries because we are just, uh, well, uh, imagine, uh, if, you know, uh, uh, we, if in Japan is one of the Asian countries, so some sort of a Asian common uh, sort of understanding or something like that. But sometimes, of course, this is an illusion. I know, of course, this is a, a quite a strong criticism regarding uh, uh, localities. But at the same time, also, we have to just get uh, some community to anyway, uh, work together for any other framework. And uh, empowerment is also, yes, a big word and easy to be manipulated. In fact, it's uh, more or less uh, real uh, uh, implication is a more political uh, sort of a power, uh, not just uh, uh, economic, but economic property itself is a very political uh, things, in fact, but uh, this is sometimes hidden uh, things. So in this sense, uh, we have to address how this realities on especially Asian countries, most of the countries, in fact, is a, well, so called uh, development dictatorship. So dictatorship is also used, so uh, this rhetoric of the empowerment or uh, sort of things, capacity building, but uh, it is also sometimes uh, it's not a uh, real meaning for the points, bottom up. Uh, also the standard, many standards over here. There. So one of the reasons why we just created the index is just to compare with uh, the sort of index, many uh, ESG index, 
uh, SDGs index, many index uh, are really you know, confusing. So we try to uh, just to get a uh, uh, discussion uh, for uh, well uh, the participation uh, to just make uh, these standards is ours, not uh, the others. So that is the point at this moment to reply to you very briefly. So now I move to the uh, uh, Nepal. Uh, last, uh, I think, uh, uh, venue for the uh, problem conference. We invite uh, my colleague of the, uh, Sarosh. Uh, please, uh, uh, yeah, you should discuss also your point of view, especially what is a serious human rights violation yourself and how to, you know, uh, address all these vulnerable peoples, in fact, to, to by this business of human rights. And what is the perspective of the future for the, this you know, uh, new sort of trend of uh, things? Okay, thank you. Please be frank. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Satu, and uh, all the panelists and respected uh, the participants of, on this virtual conference of 11th Asia, Asia Pro Bono Conference. Thank you, PLQ, uh, for, for this. Uh, for this. Uh, discussion opportunity into this one. Uh, I think I'd like to uh, share. Uh, I was in fact not going through these slides, but let me go through some slides uh, that I'd like to discuss under this one. Just hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. So, so am I audible? Yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, most of the issues have been already covered in terms of the business and human rights, its background and uh, how it emerges. So I will not go discuss much onto that one, but one of the realization is that one of the findings of we all of us is that the business enterprises have been making the negative impacts over the human rights in various forms either they are directly or indirectly from the factory, from in the supply chains or to the customer, from the employees to the environment, the ramification of the human rights jeopardy by the act of business entity is much concern for all and it's challenging too. So in this reference, I think it's well understanding that the human rights issues is much issues of the business enterprises and their impact based on the result of their business relationship that comes to the, 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 the people. And uh, we have to accept the notion that the, the human rights is really in detriment from the business enterprises. And thus we have to communicate to the business enterprises that human rights are indispensable subject matter within the corporate affairs of the business. And they have to ensure that in any functions, any, anything that they do that relates to commercial activities should not put the human rights into a detriment. On this background, we have recited the United Nations guiding principles that I'm not going to discuss into this one. But this principle is important for us to take into consideration because the United Nations realizes the importance of protecting the human rights from the business sectors. If you look into the concerns or the trends, then it is well understood and accepted that the companies may be involved with adverse human rights impact either through their own activities or as a result of their business activities. And their engagement in keeping human rights in detriment is escalating. And this, is, this should be at the earliest control, protect and until the remedy. Every day, not only in Nepal, in all over the world, we are absorbing the various issues in terms of human rights violations. That may start from, and uh, I would like to refer a, a country report that I prepared for UNDP on emerging issues of human rights in reference to Nepal, and where we found some of the important issues, including uh, this uh, labor and employment perspective, the privacy and the data protection issues, right to fair trial, 
where the the corporate they sometimes even found to be influence uh, to influence to the judiciary and to the police regarding the fair trial issues, the environmental protections, the consumer protections, the forceful acquisition of the property by the business enterprises by lobbying with the government, the supply chain perspective, the migrant workers and their exploitation matters the coercive work and the human trafficking that has been uh, much serious into the, when the corporate accent comes into this one. The indigenous people's right, right of persons with the disability, children's right to governance and uh, the investment, the intellectual property rights are some of the important human rights conscience that we observe in our contracts. So how we have to encourage for the human security. On this perspective, what I would think is that the, the business and the human rights now have become an agenda in Nepal also. The business enterprises in somehow, they seems to have accepted that the business and human rights should be their agenda too. In Nepal, the UNDP has been supporting to the entrepreneurs associations and the Nepal Bar Associations to educate and sensitize their stakeholders in terms of respecting, promoting and protecting the human rights. The Trivani University, aware of my to the practice of air, in its law courses has introduced the business and human rights issues, either directly in some of the chapter or indirectly in, in, in the various chapters. That is uh, somehow the outcome of the human rights, business and human rights is in us. We have recently conducted the national seminar um, um, among the uh, stakeholders and the faculties uh, seminar to discuss how the business and human rights courses can be introduced either as a credit hour or non-credit hour into our course. And the various research is being conducted from various perspective, from the enterprises perspective, from the labor perspective, and from the migration perspective. And myself, I prepared the country report on emerging issues of human rights. One of the important things that I would like to fight here is the Supreme Court. The, the Supreme Court during the time of the COVID stays in one of the important cases where I was myself the petitioner in the public litigations, where the Supreme Court said that the business cannot be the sole reason that when the public health is in crisis, hospitals too has a responsibility as if it stayed in the time of pandemic. The government, uh, the government of Nepal has been demonstrating its commitment to implement the UN, UN guiding principle on business and human rights. And consequent to this one, the government has drafted the national action plan on the business and human rights. Though we are, we are still in the stage of consultations and there are various uh, reservations as an academic and as a lawyer. But the good thing is that the government has framed the national uh, frame the draft uh, guiding principle on business and human rights in, in including various issues that you can see here in, in it and we have various uh, more, the constitution itself has uh, the uh, various rights that is guaranteed uh, in terms of the business and human rights that we, we relate to this one we have a uh, various multiple laws legislative framework and even we have ratified the ILO conventions we have ratified seven core human rights convention into this one and that ensures that is some of the encouraging story for the human rights in this one and so we as i said we have a draft action plan on business and human rights including the environment consumer rights children and women rights the gender gender equality issues the uh, and even conducting for the human rights due diligence and provisions of the remedy is there. So, uh, if we talk about the NISDA pro bono network, uh, I'm uh, I'm very positive that such initiations has been now in in the international uh, networks, and I strongly encourage uh, the all the lawyers working for human rights are related to the business so I'll come to have to come together and be looking into one platform so that we can ensure that the human rights further should not be damaged uh, any further and uh, well uh, to uh, to conclude into this one uh, that how the pro bono how as a pro bono how we can promote the business and human rights is, is something um, that I would like to suggest that they are uh, we, we, as a lawyer and as a human rights activist, as a pro bono activist, uh, we have a very important role in ensuring that 
the human rights is protected against the business enterprises. We can't rely over the states uh, and the legal aid because they are insufficient. So as a lawyer and as a stakeholders, we have to take this opportunity to serve the pro bono for the humanity. And so we know that there is a difficulty in supporting um, supporting them, but it's easier is that before any damage happens, we have to make sure that the business actors are warned, they are educated, they are sensitized, and where required, they um, will, they they have to pay the remedy, and that is possible only by the lawyers. And we, the lawyers, as a social engineer, we have a responsibility to ensure that the business actors not in any way damage the human rights issues. So uh, with this one, um, I would like to conclude my presentation with the conviction that the human rights has become really the matter of um, matter in terms of the business enterprises activity, not only in Nepal, not only in Japan, or not only in Korea, it's all over the world. So mm. we, the lawyers, we, the activists, let's come into the platform, let's come into the network, and we, our networks will definitely contribute to protect the human rights and to support them for um, further remedy and making them, uh, ensuring them that they have the access to justice. Thank you, Satu, for my short presentation. And if there is any questions, I'll come back. Thank you very much, uh, Saroj. It's an excellent presentation, very comprehensive and uh, clear and uh, very detailed in such a short uh, time. I uh, really appreciate And uh, uh, your point is a really great in fact, uh, the education the uh, really focus of empowerment anyway. So, yeah, as you say, uh, the uh, human rights are universal, universal value, no uh, discrimination depending on the states or nationalities. This is a we are all human, so same value. But the unfortunately, the reality is different in the diversities uh, to no different. Uh, so we uh, each other ignorant each other. So the point is, uh, we should learn each other from others. So in such a way, I think this project is uh, 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 still the open, uh, no, open end strategic sort of things. Uh, we will get a feedback from the uh, local peoples and government and companies. Uh, then this should be also uh, incorporated to the version up. For in such a way, we just make a some kind of fitting in. Uh, uh, in a, uh, this uh, local uh, reality. So otherwise, you know, just a huge gap as I always uh, manipulate it, take advantage. That is a reality of the, uh, our nation state system. This nation state system is uh, making peace, maintain peace, but uh, the same time on the same other side of the same coin, this is also oppressive the people who, have, you know, not be protected national security or just be national security is uh, actually persecuting uh, human beings. So we have to uh, work for the human rights, these vulnerable, in fact, uh, for migrants and so. Uh, thank you very much. So we move on the, uh, yeah, Japan again. The, uh, Takeshi will uh, just report uh, some recent government also guidelines, uh, I think uh, very brand new ones. So. Uh, please, uh, uh, Takeshi, your yes, floor. Thank you, Professor Sato. My name is Takeshi Nemoto. Uh, I'm a partner at Nishimura and, and Asahi, the largest law firm in Japan. I am a member of Pro Bono Committee at our firm. As uh, Professor Fujino explained about the uh, situation in Japan, I would like to talk uh, from another aspect of business and human rights in Japan. Firstly, I'd like to briefly explain about the uh, human rights due diligence guidance published by the Japanese government on September 13 this year. Uh, it's brand new guideline. Secondly, <laughs> yes. Secondly, I will talk about pro bono activities by business lawyers in Japan. 
Next slide, please. Yeah. In October uh, 2020, the Japanese government launched a national action plan on business and human rights based on the UN guide, guiding principles. In November two, uh, 2021, uh, as part of follow-up on the national action plan, uh, the results of the survey on the status of efforts on human rights in the supply chains of Japanese companies that was conducted by the Japanese government were published. The survey presented the Japanese corporation's strong demands to establish guidelines. In consideration of such situations, in March 2022, this year, the Japanese government established the study group on guidelines for respecting human rights in supply chains and held further discussions to promote corporate activities to respect human rights uh, based on international standards. Then on September 13, the guidelines was established and published. Next slide, please. In the guidelines, uh, it is mentioned that Japan is expected to display its leadership in promoting efforts to respect human rights in Asia. The guideline is established based on the UN guiding principles and other international standards. And also in a concrete and easy to understand manner in line with the actual situations of business enterprises engaging in business activities in Japan. The guideline is a good start point, but not perfect one. So the guideline will be reviewed in association with future developments of international standards. Next slide, please. Secondly, I'd like to talk about business lawyers' problem activities in Japan using an example of Business Lawyers Global Network, BLPN. Business Lawyers Global Network is a network of, Jap uh, of uh, Japanese business lawyers who are interested in global activities. BLPN was established in August 2012. BLPN's vision is that each member fulfills its social mission by working together with NPOs, NGOs, and the social sector to resolve the social issues using business law skills. Now, more than 70 people, such as lawyers in law firm, in-house lawyers, and law school students belong to the network. Professor Sato, Haruki, and me are also members. Next slide, please. NPOs contact BAPN through its website to seek legal advice pro bono. Then BAPN circulates the contact information in the network and member lawyer who has skills and expertise in the project voluntarily takes on the project. As you may know, some countries have a clearing house which connect people in need of legal services and lawyers who can do global work. In Japan, there is no clearing house now, but BLPN is acting a kind of role of a clearing house. Next slide, please. Main client of BLPN is NPOs and NGOs. We have conducted various legal advice. For example, drafting agreements, review of internal rules, advising on labor law matter, 
harassment issues. Next slide, please. Regarding the human rights context, I have supported pro bono and NGO to publish a report regarding legislation of business and human rights in foreign countries. But to my knowledge, there is not so many pro bono projects on business and human rights in Japan. This is the current situation. I will talk about some example of expected pro bono activities by business lawyers in Japan. Firstly, establishing the guideline by the government itself does not mean anything. It is important to promote guidelines. So business lawyers should deeply understand the guideline and promote it to companies. Next, NGOs take an important role to deal with business and human rights issues. Sometimes direct dialogue between companies and NGOs might cause unnecessary disputes. Business lawyers who have experiences to work together with both companies and NGOs will be able to act useful role in such dialogue because they can provide legal advice from perspective, both company side and NGO side. In addition, even small companies should conduct human rights due diligence. But indeed, most small companies do not have enough financial resources or human resources to conduct due diligence. If lawyers support human rights due diligence pro bono for companies with a weak financial base, like small companies, it would be helpful to spread human rights due diligence in Japan. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Takeshi. Uh, very good uh, for uh, just updating of this uh, Japanese situation. And uh, I, I think uh, Yang, Yang Pak, Yang Pak uh, you uh, uh, want uh, some intervention, some question to him or? Yes? Just briefly. Uh, sorry, I, I think I touched something wrongly. I, <laughs> okay, I, okay. I, 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 yeah, sorry. For All right, no worry. <laughs> So uh, let's go to the uh, last uh, presenter, but not least, uh, our friend from the, uh, Malaysia. Uh, she's joining from uh, Malaysia, Alexis Nexus. Uh, we had uh, also nice uh, uh, cooperation so far. Uh, the Alexis Nexus uh, in, in Japan is uh, my sort of research partner as a pro bono. He, they actually provided for the data uh, of their own. Uh, normally, this charge, charge charge us a huge amount of the, you know royalties, but they just exempted for our uh, database of the uh, refugees uh, uh, countries operation or some uh, origin original place because uh, it's very difficult to obtain any such uh, uh, countries uh, information uh, frank real information. Uh, because most of countries uh, refuse to uh, release uh, uh, any sort of uh, sensitive, uh, of course, information. But uh, Lexus Nexus is uh, really the uh, you know global uh, companies uh, to monitor all this kind of data, legal data. So in this sense, they are very much powerful uh, partners. In fact, and uh, uh, actually, so Guy Tori is also invited to trip to Japan, and uh, I remember the uh, Guy Tori and also um, my friend of the. Uh, Unilever also made a nice panel discussion on business human rights, both uh, really global uh, kind of leading companies of this uh, field. And also, uh, I think uh, our uh, program conference in the Kuala Lumpur, the, I, I think uh, this, uh, yeah, as I said, um, my students, in fact, uh, Erika uh, actually was participated and then, so we are very happy to receive uh, you right here again. Please, uh, your floor, 10 minutes. Yeah, please. Thanks so much, Professor. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, as Professor had just um, 
uh, explained, I work for a global multinational company. So I just give you a little bit of context. We deal with legal information, which means we publish the law in 130 countries, but we are also a technology company. So we store um, and manage the data um, and in a secure manner as well. So um, it's great that I'm going last and I will have some slides to, sh uh, to share with you in a minute or so, but I wanted to just capture the essence of what has been discussed by my fellow panelists so far, right? So Saroj from Nepal talked about the damage that businesses does. Why is this that we need business for, the, for human rights? Why is it that we need an index um, for corporate human security, for example? It's because um, we weren't governing businesses in the beginning. So businesses just cared about making money and we destroyed the environment, we destroyed people, um, we leveraged and abused and took advantage of people for profit, for gain. And then eventually the community and external pressures gave us a conscience. And now we are moving towards doing less and less damage. That's where we are in the present. So in the past, it was, it doesn't matter, do whatever damage you want. I won't even look at it. Um, now there is do less damage. That's the call, which is do less damage. And then there is uh, in many of the more mature uh, jurisdictions and markets, uh, it is, how do you ensure that you do business in as clean uh, and full of integrity manner uh, as possible, which is, um, uh, you know, don't employ child labor, um, check on your supply chain um, as well. How do we make sure that human rights are respected throughout our entire value chain um, of our business? And there's a lot of focus on internal processes. Are you doing the right thing internally? Uh, are you hiring the right people and treating your employees right internally? And then are your supply chain partners doing the same uh, as well? Um, but what I'm going to share today is a parallel perspective, which is equally important, um, which is what can companies to do to further that, which is actually make positive impact in society. And I think the corporate, corporate um, human security index touches upon that a little bit because you talk about empowerment. And a lot of businesses, all of us, whether you're training externally or not, whether you're building capacity externally in societies or not, you're building capacity within because you have to do business. You're learning new processes. You're learning new um, uh, information, uh, new technologies, and you always need to train your employees. So every business, every corporation has that skill set and has a structure to train people, human beings. And that means empowerment because knowledge empowers. So um, I guess my question to the CHSI is, what can we do on a practical level to enable businesses to take these skills we have internally to take it outside and train external people, regular people on things. And then the metric that we use to measure the success would be how many people have been trained in this knowledge, in what manner, and how many people have we simplified, simplified knowledge on and they have learned something and therefore empowered in a specific area as well. I would propose that uh, for the CHSI. So now I'd like to share um, some uh, work, um, just a few projects that is relevant to my uh, organization and my um, business, um, just to, to um, go back a little bit. Um, the, our corporate mission in LexisNexis is to advance the rule of law. And internally, we communicate this very, very widely, and it is very, very top down. So this is from the big bosses um, to everyone, every single uh, employee um, across the world. And our equation is equality under the law plus transparency of the law plus independent judiciary and access to remedies. And that equals the rule of law. So that is our internal rule of law e equation. It took years to communicate this widely and for every employee to understand it. And it took, also took years for management, top leadership, middle leadership, middle leadership to understand uh, as well so that all over the world, employees are not saying, well, you say that in headquarters, but that's not happening in Malaysia, for example. I think that's um, really important. Um, we are a UN Global Compact 
lead company, um, the Relax organization, our parent company is. Um, with us internally, we focus on um, SDG number 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. Um, that is because of our expertise dealing with legal information as well. Um, and uh, we did create um, the rule of law framework uh, and work together with the United Nations Global Compact uh, as well. We also set up a rule of law, law foundation. Uh, we launched it in 2019. And advancing the rule of law is a uh, KPI in um, senior leadership. So every year we get this um, senior leadership KPI and we know that our global CEO has this in his KPI and all of us have this in our KPI as well. So it forces us to think about what we can do in our respective local uh, markets as well. Now I'd like to just share a couple of examples, one globally and uh, one um, closer to our heart within Southeast Asia as well. I, the Eyewitness to Atrocities app, I'd like to talk to you about this as well. If you Google this, you will see a lot of latest footage, uh, latest news articles about what is happening in Ukraine. So um, when the, the app was created a few years ago, um, and how the app works uh, essentially is that you take, um, we, you, we work with organizations um, on the ground in a specific country. They would collect information and they would train the public on collecting information. Um, and the information is in the form of video footages as well as pictures, photographs. It is collected in that app, which is secure. The chain of, of custody is maintained throughout. It goes into the LexisNexis servers. So the integrity of that is maintained and it is it can be brought into court in the international criminal court as evidence especially of war crimes um, as well so we use our servers our technology to support the creation uh, of this and we host um, the footage and images and inf information as well so in ukraine when we roll it out um, right now there's more than thirteen thousand footages already captured uh, as well. And closer in 2021, when the coup happened in Myanmar, we tried, we worked with um, the IBA, the International Bar Association, um, to translate the app into the Myanmar language. And we worked with local uh, NGOs across Myanmar to train people to capture footages as well. Remember, right now, everybody uses Facebook Live um, uh, when, when um, war crimes happen or if there is a war or conflict within a country, but that's not useful for gathering evidence. So we really need the, this um, to be used so that um, the chain of custody is preserved as well. And um, the impact is um, in 2018, a military tribunal um, in the De Democratic Republic of Congo found two commanders of the Democratic Forces for Liberation of Rwanda guilty of murder and torture after the court reviewed and received photos and video evidence captured by the app uh, as well. So it really does um, end uh, in something positive and impactful as well. And it is just a matter of taking our expertise, all our technologies and building something uh, for the outside um, society as well as and when um, it is needed. Another example I'd like to share is Myanmar. So when the coup happened in Myanmar, we found that a lot of lawyers were defending um, detainees because they were protesting out in the streets and they were just arrested and detained. And uh, a lot of lawyers um, were just doing this very in a very reactionary manner uh, in Myanmar. And they weren't very structured. Um, they weren't sure um, how to you know, which law to use, which law not to use, and things like that uh, as well. So two things happen. Our legal editorial team uh, helped work together um, with the legal aid centers to give out practice tips to lawyers so that they, are, they have this guidebook easy for them to um, defend uh, and extend better support to Myanmar detainees, uh, female detainees especially as well. We also had regular Saturday sessions um, with lawyers who were hoping to get tips from junior lawyers who were hoping to get tips and understanding from more senior lawyers as well. And 
uh, we, we just did as simple as facilitate the connection between the teacher and the student uh, as well, using our network uh, as well. And these were regular staff members of mine, employees who are working on content, working on legal contract books, etc. They just applied their knowledge um, in doing so. And this is very, very recent. Um, when um, the war uh, commenced and happened in Ukraine, um, a couple of months later, um, we had a dialogue globally together with the Ukraine National Bar Association. Um, and it surfaced that one of the needs of Ukrainian lawyers at that time was because they were escaping the country and they were going outside uh, of Ukraine to the rest of Europe, they couldn't find jobs uh, anywhere and they couldn't, they weren't sure how to um, find employment and, and advertise their expertise or their legal um, expertise as well. So globally, what happened was our chief product officer put out a call for volunteers across the world. Um, employees would log into our site internally to volunteer to work on the specific portal, this particular portal. And it was split into data scientists, technologists, as well as regular people, salespeople, marketing people as well. Um, and with that volunteer group of people, we were organized enough um, that we created a portal for Ukrainian lawyers to look for jobs. And for lawyers and law firms uh, outside of Ukraine to advertise available jobs um, as well. Um, so this is also an example of what companies can do to just magnify the skill set um, that you have uh, within your organization uh, as well. Um, that's all I have to share. I uh, look forward to um, answering questions later as well. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy Tori. It's uh, really, indeed, uh, all the time, your presentation is so beautiful and so persuasive and very uh, so uh, impressive, your activities in Ukraine and uh, this Myanmar case. Uh, in fact, uh, really, uh, this eyewitness is, a uh, well, modern sort of uh, technology is uh, working, applying for this, for good for the peace and human rights, that is a good sign. And so, uh, yeah, uh, you pointed out uh, a very uh, important point, this is practical uh, application for this uh, index, in fact, so that we are not actually the business persons. Uh, of course, some of them are part, uh, made a comment, uh, but uh, especially the internal sort of uh, efforts of the education, these sort of things should be also be uh, well uh, addressed uh, any sort of things. So in this context, uh, this uh, index is also uh, have a, a report have also case studies portions. Uh, in fact, this uh, time, this was uh, uh, cut it uh, off because of time constraint. But uh, I think uh, uh, my research assistant to the uh, Haruki at the, may I call the Haruki who's also the, uh, worked for especially case studies in some Japanese companies. Uh, from uh, uh, Haruki's point of view, how do you respond to the uh, question and comment by the Gaitori or uh, even from the Kirikus, uh, very, very, uh, you know, critical point for this uh, project, oh. or even the uh, Shina, uh, if you like, please, please intervene. Yes, I am Haruki mm -hmm. Matsui. Mm -hmm. And I am a first year lawyer in Japan, and mm -hmm. I was involved in CHSI project with Professor Sato and uh, Mr. Fujino. And the company I did case study about is a DPI, the company man manufacturing food tray. The company adopted advanced measures for handicapped people, and it employed a lot of uh, people with a disability and made a policy specifically for handicapped people. Uh, and the policy was made especially for handicapped people. This, this kind of measure is very unique in Japan and should be evaluated high, in, in my opinion. But uh, in international standards, uh, the company is 
uh, evaluated low because it has insufficient mechanism for grievance. But uh, as uh, Fujino explained, I think that this kind of autonomous measures should be evaluated. And I think in, in that in that meaning, I think CHSI project is a meaningful. And about one one point to Pil Pilfield view, you said that yeah, this in what point this is originally original in Asian context. I think mm, CHSI project respects a autonomous measure, respecting a empowerment of people, a vulnerable people. I think this is a this derives from the concept human security. And human security is a is said by Sadako Ogata. And that policy is a little different from his human rights. And I think and respecting a a human security, this concept, and this is, I think, uh, originally original in Asia, and I think that is one point that ASEAN can emphasize on. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, as Haruki said, uh, this Asian context from Asia uh, does it does not mean. Uh, any Japan will just representing Asia or Asia. Uh, of course, we don't have such ambitions. Ambitions, and rather we just invite all the uh, partners in Asia actually for participate to uh, give uh, any uh, sort of uh, uh, additional uh, points we are missing or we are misunderstanding. That is why the learning process. This is a kind of a social experiment. Uh, so uh, we just promote this uh, uh, index should be tested in the realities. Then feedback, it's not good, it's not, uh, ena not enough. Or... So things we will just uh, revising, revising. And so that's why this is a sort of open-end process. So in this sense, I really want uh, Hiroku and uh, <laughs> Koreans also uh, come uh, and work with us. So this is not just just Japanese sort of, a, uh, uh, of course, uh, standard, just kind of, a, we will just find our standard in some way. Um, that is the uh, case. Uh, oh, yeah, um, uh, we have uh, some question. Any other question in the panelists? It's no, not uh, each other. So in, in case, so uh, we have a uh, one, uh, yeah, um, uh, question from the uh, audience, uh, please. Uh, uh, yeah, B yeah, Bishu, uh, you also participate in the mo morning session. It's a, it's a really uh, interesting. This is related with us at different angles. So please, any question or comments? Yes. Thank you. I think uh, first of all, any young. Uh, namaste and konnichiwa to all uh, the panelists. I thought it was a brilliant session and very, very useful to understand the sort of stuff that you're all doing. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, what, uh, you know, Professor Sato uh, was saying about having a shared understanding of what it means to be responsible business houses. So, uh, as you know, I've previously been working with some supply chain uh, uh, supply chain organizers in India and in the region. And I think it'll be really, really interesting. And that's the conversation that I would like to take forward if uh, everybody's on board, because I think it'll be very useful to have the sort of contextual understanding of what it means to be responsibly uh, running a business in the region, especially because um, as Professor Asako said, it's, it's an ambitious project, but you know, mm -hmm. certainly one that has merit. So uh, we do have some pro bono uh, lawyers who are already working on it. We also have some in-house expertise on the SDGs as well. So it will be great to collaborate. And uh, it's, it's less of a question, more of a congratulations on how wonderful it was to hear all of you and uh, how coherently you condensed all the materials. So thanks mm. very much. Mm, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, my uh, knowledge is uh, uh, Asian developing countries not so uh, enough, probably is very limited, but uh, from my Experience in the Cambodia case, as I said, you know, 
Uh, we uh, assisting the Cambodian government to have a rule of law, so judicial uh, law reform assistance, so uh, drafting a new law and uh, creating uh, uh, judges and uh, public prosecutors and lawyers for rule of law and independence judiciary. But uh, as you may know now, Cambodia is uh, really you know, not uh, we are intended to, <laughs> in fact, is, uh, <laughs> going back to the old days, the more um, kind of a mm, uh, dictatorship uh, for the, unfortunately, um, and the law is actually manipulated <laughs> by the authorities, just a ruling purpose, not just for the protection of the peoples. That is a really the uh, irony or paradox because we just uh, uh, missed, uh, uh, you know, um, the uh, government is always representing all the peoples. <laughs> you know, it's not like that. Just a government is consisted of the powerful, uh, very privileged persons, vested interest always. So we have to be very careful, not only the just because Japanese ODA is, of course, public funds. So in this sense, we have to respect the sublimity of the country. So this, yeah. you know, legal sort of a uh, framework is sometimes uh, very, you know, harsh against the uh, peoples uh, in case of the normal uh, in the developing countries, more or less developing countries unstable. So in order to keep the, uh, you know, societies uh, order and uh, stable, sometimes uh, government will give uh, oppression uh, well extreme is a uh, Myanmar case Myanmar case is very exceptional I I hope <laughs> anyway um, so in such uh, political realities and economic uh, realities yes. yeah, we are just outsiders so we have to be very careful we should be first of all well uh, you know analyze the situation but uh, we are not such as knowledgeable Oh, that is why we invite uh, any uh, local uh, knowledge or the grassroots sort of NGOs, the lawyers working for the, this uh, pro bono, I, I think, uh, because of the, uh, for the other partner, important partner of the stakeholders. All right, so uh, well, we have a more, uh, yeah, question from the, yeah, Kayo. Kai Song, uh, so, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> this is some, some, <laughs> so many. Somani, please uh, introduce you. yourself first. In, yeah. Hi, my name is Somani uh, I'm working for UDP, La PDA, uh, uh -huh. and assess uh, to judge this program. Okay, good. You know, first of all, you know, thanks so much to the presenters, all the presenters. You know, I also want to uh, share some observation and I have a few questions, you know, to, to you all. For example, you know, when we uh, look at the... Um, um, business and human rights, you know, when the government, you know, uh, indeed, they really have to balance, you know, on, on these things. For example, uh, on, on the one hand, they also want to protect human rights, and at the same time, they want to promote investment, you know, for example. And so that's why their policy and uh, legal framework is have to be favored. For example, you know, mostly in the case of Laos, you know, when we are still uh, need more uh, foreign direct uh, investment, you know, when you have to really balance your uh, legal favors that you have to in favor of, uh, you know, the business uh, sector or the corporate. So with that, you know, uh, my question is, you know, uh, how to encourage a uh, corporate to be more social responsive. I think, uh, I think this, um, you know, if the government, um, um, uh, themselves, you know, to do this, maybe it's not really sufficient, you know, if the business or corporate themselves not really volunteer and mm. really, really think of the business mm. uh, and human rights. So I mm. think that's very really important. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. And another question also, you know, on how can we enhance the government policy and also, you know, to make sure that, you know, uh, they promote the uh, ESG. So I, I mean, this also uh, something that uh, this... Um, seem to me that it's still uh, new, you know, for, for the uh, Lao uh, government in, in this area. And especially, you know, um, we are here, uh, you know, except that, you know, the role of the uh, uh, lawyers is very important, you know, to to promote the uh, business and human rights and promote the ESG. So uh, how we can, you know, um, make sure that the government really see this very important role of the lawyers and they can enhance their their roles, you know, in um, you know, into this work more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so you're from uh, 
from Laos. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, great intervention. Well, um, I would like to ask uh, Gaitori, in fact, about uh, this first question regarding companies, how you know, company can be promote uh, this uh, empowerment uh, things. And I just wondered sometimes, you know, for you are sort of a, um, I witness uh, watch this sort of a, a techniques should be also uh, connected to the supply chain monitoring, something like that. Because, you know, the, uh, we Japanese also bring uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, smartphone. And also sometimes we just put in a, a QR code for the origin of this food and how this calorie <laughs> sort of things. Maybe some sort of, a, you know, supply chain and any program, any sort of, a, you know, yeah. uh, work or uh, something human rights violation or <laughs> some sort of, uh, exploitation. This information should be also you know, provided for freely for the anyone. So then the people and the consumer will knowledgeable. So they, they realize which coffee is better, even if it's cheaper, but bad. <laughs> you know, affordable person will, of course, pay for that, for the value. It's not, value is not just a kind of product itself. The product is a kind of end for the, the supply chain. So we are always uh, communicating with, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, these local people, if coming from local, always, uh, because now we are transparent like that, such a you know, uh, distance. We easy to <laughs> access <laughs> as a real time. So in, in such a uh, you know, monitoring system, should be utilized so the more less for the transparency of the traceability of the people. So we are, our people can also um, uh, have a, uh, also access for that and always just to a, a picture and just uh, upload it <laughs> and you will just, you know, just um, edit it and sort of comment and some sort of things. That is also possible. <laughs> My yeah, I think that's a great idea, Professor. <laughs> I think that there are a few things here. There are so many indexes around the world, right? We yeah, have yeah. this CHSI, then there are many, many, right? World Justice Project, et cetera, et cetera. And I know many of these indexes, um, they go and interview people uh, one by one manually. I would propose that you add crowdsourcing information into um, how you calculate your metrics. So the more uh, information you have, the more you are able to manage uh, and assess the index uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And I think that's a I think that's where we are headed. Um, mm -hmm. Crowdsourcing of information mm -hmm. and crowdsourcing okay. of data is where we are headed. Um, to Somami's question of how do you attract, um, and I guess how does a country balance, a country like Laos balance between the FDI um, and, uh, you know, doing business uh, humanely, business for human rights, for example. Mm -hmm. I think there are a few components here. The more we name and shame companies, um, the more companies feel the pressure to change their practices. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, I'm a business leader and I think it, it works. The naming and shaming and the pressure um, works. The more pressure you feel, um, the, the, the harder the company will try mm -hmm. um, to do business the right way. Yeah, thank That's you very one much. Mm, yes. uh, component. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other component is, I, I would feel that the country needs to look at where you want to attract your FDI. Mm. Um, more and more, many companies in... Uh, many, many jurisdictions are already practicing checking the right supply chain management already. Mm -hmm. So if you get, um, you attract and you target and hunt for FDI from those companies, then those companies will come and invest in Laos mm -hmm. and they will conduct uh, due diligence on their supply chain as well. So I think it, it just requires that from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, my also students, many students are also interested in the social uh, business, uh, you know, uh, new sort of a small, you know, uh, business uh, starting even Africa or uh, some, yeah, maybe Laos. So why not? Uh, this is a, a starting of uh, this uh, new sort of business uh, paradigm, I think. Uh, Phil Q, could you just answer to the second question? The ESG is uh, really, uh, Korea is uh, most advanced in Asia, probably. How no <laughs> ESG should be also uh, respected or uh, adopted in uh, uh, Laos and such a country? What do you think? Uh, you have any, any, any sort of reply to 
that my call is that well i mean when you talk about business and human rights and esg and sdg i mean all this uh, has some components that should be shared and should be implemented so i mean it, it depends on the, the cultural approach of the government and uh, business and civil society in, in each country we, we, what kind of emphasis will be there i mean and what what kind of uh, capacity is will be there to to do something with uh, some some guidelines or, or index or any any kind of um, standards so i mean i'm not that familiar with the situation in Lao, but um, I mean, but Lao is also familiar with SDG and and other international standards. So maybe uh, Lao Lao can start with this this uh, existing or uh, already kind of uh, familiar uh, some standards or criteria, and then uh, can expand or adopt some other uh, criteria or standards in the mm -hmm. future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks to your cooperation. Uh, now time is up, uh, just in time. But uh, uh, Erika, please, uh, you just uh, also uh, <laughs> come and also greet uh, to them, especially the, do you remember the Gaitori? No, you, you are also participated in uh, Kuala Lumpur study tour. Um, yes, I actually joined the yes, Kuala Lumpur conference. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yes, but, but uh, sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are we we met in this yeah in that yeah we visited the uh, Texas uh, Nexus uh, <laughs> in the Kuala Lumpur, I think. Um, anyway, yeah, the so uh, Erika is uh, going to work in uh, Hanoi, Vietnam, so mm -hmm. the office of yeah. the Nishimura. So in fact, they are practicing in uh, uh, Vietnam. So. In this sense, maybe you should have a good connection with these partners, uh, probably, um, because Asian cultures and uh, so different from Japanese one, of course, but we should appreciate, enjoy it. So diversity is uh, very important, sometimes difficulty, but uh, also this is a chance, I, I think. So I, I think I just uh, conclude this session. This is uh, just, you know, not to conclude all the project also, uh, as I said, the corporate sec uh, human security index is a kind of a, a open end. We just invite your participation. Your participation, that is why we should Asia, because if you belong to Asia, you believe in <laughs> Asian value, I don't know, but uh, this is also different each other, of course. But uh, we should learn each other, respect each other's view anyway. Uh, so that is a uh, most important thing for us to uh, kind of network uh, uh, to work, complement, and also sometimes check and balance uh, uh, for the new governance. I call it uh, network governance because national state system is now outdated. It doesn't work. That is why the UN is uh, impotent. So well, who will actually be responsible? We, civilians. We private sectors, non-state sectors, of course, state is, government is still important partner, but uh, it's a very much, you cannot absolute uh, these uh, uh, relative uh, uh, roles. So, so we have to uh, work together. Uh, so I hope this continue. Next week, the 23rd, uh, we are focusing on more uh, interesting topic that is access to remedy. Remedy, what kind of remedy is uh, really you know, viable, uh, the justifiable things? That is a point, especially the lawyer's point of view, not just a court, <laughs> because this is a soft law, it's not hard law. So in this sense, uh, ADL, but a kind of a special mechanism for the grievance mechanism. Now Japan, or our group just proposed, and so it was now starting uh, this as a also a exper experimental stage. So I hope the, especially the Koreans, the lawyers also come and work together to because enrich so the uh, exchange these views and more or less you know, we can uh, uh, work collaborate collaborate for the future uh, better world. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your uh, sort of a very frank discussions. We are very much uh, from you. And uh, let's keep in touch, continue. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank See you, Professor. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Oh, magic word. Marginalize. Oh, it's all right. Hi, Thank everyone.
สบายดีอันถูกเขาห่วมจากเล่าอย่าลืมอัน safe magic word ของอาวาลานี่เนาะนั่นคำว่า marginalize เนาะเพื่อให้บรรดาฐานได้อาใบยังยืนสําหรับการเขาห่วมในวาลานี่เนาะโดยหลังจาก safe ตัวนี้แล้วจึงสามารถออกได้ขอบใจอ่า no I just inform uh, allow participants to uh, save the magic word of this session โอเคโอเคบายบายเอวันปิดเลยก็ได้จู